So imagine this, you get to the boat ramp and you ask somebody, hey man, how was your fishing day? Did you catch them? And they answer, man, I was just, you know, out there soaking my cricket on right in the middle of the juice in those laydowns. And I absolutely got slabbergasted by a toad, man. It was incredible. And you look at him and you're like, man, I, I totally know what you're talking about. But in reality, you don't have an earthly clue what that guy was just saying. That little sketch, while funny, actually happened to me quite a lot when I was a beginner bass angler, and I guarantee it's happened to you guys as well. You know, bass fishing is a sport that is filled with so much jargon and terminology, and uh, to the beginner angler, it can seem totally overwhelming by hearing all these terms, you have no clue what they mean, and especially in watching instructional videos, uh, it can be a quite daunting task to try to understand all of those and apply them out on the water while chasing an ever-changing green fish. And so, the purpose of today's video is to sit down go all around the lake today and literally talk about every single uh, bass fishing term that I can think of. You know, I'm sure I'm going to miss some today. Some of these topics are going to be covered in 10-15 seconds. And so uh, a cool new YouTube update is here on the play bar on the bottom on both computer and mobile phone. Uh, you guys can see little segments and in, in places I've separated the video based on topics. So if you guys, you know, know the, the, the term that I'm going to talk about in the video, y'all can feel free to skip to a different section of the video. And I will have these sections in all of my instructional videos. What the heck? Is that a fish or a bird? So this video will be separated into to two main parts, the first of which being uh, my specific message to anglers that are asking me advice on their local bodies of water. So I'm going to tell you guys the exact terminologies you have to understand in order for me to help you. I get DMs all the time of people asking, uh, what's the best lure for my pond? I live in Ohio. What should I throw? And there's a lot more questions that I have to have answers to before I can answer your question about which lures to throw. I love helping you guys out, but this video is meant for you. And then the second half of this video, and probably the majority of it, is going to be all sorts of fishing terminology from serious all the way to super silly stuff that we say on the water that uh, to any sort of non-fisherman would make zero sense. But to us, it makes a whole heck of a lot of sense. So make sure you guys tune in, subscribe to this channel. I'm so glad y'all are here, and let's jump into it. I feel like when most anglers ask me the question of, hey, I'm fishing a pond, what lure should I throw? Fishing this lake, what technique should I try? I feel like most people think there's a list of lures and techniques out there that work all across the country and catch big ones all the time. And that's not really true. You know, there's a few lures like the popper, the cinco, the, the chatterbait, the spinnerbait. Those ones work in basically all conditions at many, many times of the year. Uh, but if you are only using those recommendations uh, for your pond or your lake, you're going to drastically minimize the success that you could be having. And so let's talk about some terminology that in order for me to help you guys uh, on Instagram or Facebook or even the YouTube comment section, when you guys ask for my help with lure and location recommendations, what I have to know about your body of water in order to help you. And again, as always in these instructional videos, you may have a slightly different definition about one of these terms that I'm going to talk about, but these are, in general, my terms that I have learned from my bass fishing experience uh, from mentors and friends and uh, doing plenty of online fishing research. So let's jump into it. So the first thing I need to know when telling you guys what to fish is where you are at in the country. People ask me all the time uh, in Instagram DMs, what, uh, what lure should I throw this time of year? That's the exact question. What lures should I throw this time of year? Well, if you're in Miami, my recommendations are not going to be the same as if you are in upstate New York. It's just not that the fish are not in the same stage of anything. And so when I talked about stage, you have to understand that bass throughout the year, no matter where you are in the country, uh, go on a, a four season stage. So summer, fall, winter, and spring, just like we have, they have, I'd say six to eight seasons, not four like we do. And they're called a few different things. And so uh, the first thing is going to be in the winter, you have the winter bite, you have the pre-spawn, and then come springtime, you have the spawn and the post-spawn. Come summer, you have basically summer, early summer, middle summer, and late summer. And in the fall, you have the uh, the fall bite into the winter bite that can oftentimes lead to a quick pre-spawn bite. So that's kind of the, the bass life cycle. I'm not going to go deep into that, but you have to understand 
and there's plenty of videos out there, you've got to understand what the bass life cycle is because if you ask me for fishing tips in June in Miami, uh, that's going to be way different than fishing tips in upstate New York in June just because the bass are in different stages of the year because they're in different parts of the country. So after telling me where you are in the country, you've got to tell me what the body of water is like. So we're going to talk about a few terms right now. The first of those being cover and structure. And I think the definition in at least in my sense is pretty easy. Structure is something the bass can sit on or live in that is uh, usually under the water and cover is usually something that is uh, on top of the water or over the water. As the name suggests, it covers the bass. Now, of course, you're free to disagree on this, uh, this definition here, but I think that cover is anything like um, floating vegetation, lily pads, docks, overhanging trees, anything that casts a shadow or shade. That is what's, what I call cover. Structure is anything that is down there on the bottom usually. So whether that's aquatic vegetation, standing timber, rock piles, uh, a ledge, I guess you might be able to call as a structure. And we'll talk about all these terms specifically later on in this video. But in order for me to understand what your pond or lake is like, you've got to tell me what kind of cover and structure you have. So what the bass have to live around and find protection from uh, from the elements and from other things trying to eat them. The next thing is water clarity. It's very important uh, for lure and, and, and location recommendations to understand what the water clarity does to your bass uh, scenario. So if you got super clear water, I'm not going to recommend the same the same lures or techniques as if you have dirty water. So that's another important factor. The next term is forage. And you may have never heard that term before, but that generally means in the, the fishing world what your fish are eating, the food that your fish are feeding on. And so that could be crawfish, bluegills, shad, um, you know, freshwater prawns, I don't know, frogs. There's tons of stuff that bass could eat depending on where you are in the country. Mayflies, leeches. You have to tell me what the main forage is of your pond. That way I can recommend those lures. And this is a, a very important thing, not just for me recommending lures to people, but you have to understand when you go to a body of water, what are those bass eating there? Now you may have to do some research. You may have to throw a little, I don't know, jig head out there and see if you can catch some bluegill, some crappie, um, some, some perch, some gobies. Uh, you have to figure out what lives down there. And usually Google is very helpful. So you can search, uh, at least in Texas, all the lakes in Texas for Texas Parks and Wildlife have uh, forage species that are, that are stocked in there. They tell you what those bass are eating. And so it makes it a lot easier for me to recommend lures and for you guys to understand what is, uh, what is happening in your body of water. So forage is an important term to understand. Another thing when I'm recommending lures is that I have to know what type of bass you're going after because largemouth bass, spotted bass, and smallmouth bass all have different tendencies and they tend to be in different uh, stages throughout the year. They all kind of converge in the winter and in the summer, but throughout the spring and the fall, they're almost always doing different stuff. Uh, and so in ponds, of course, you're mostly going to have largemouth bass, but if you somehow have spotted bass or smallmouth in your pond, that'd be helpful to know because they're going to react differently. So I want to make sure if you're asking for tips on Lake Cumberland, I'm going to give you vastly different tips for that lake than I'm going to give you on Kentucky Lake, even though those are very similar lakes or close lakes to each other, they are very different in terms of how they fish. And like I said at the beginning, understanding the bass life cycle, I'll mention this several times throughout the video, is incredibly crucial to becoming a good bass angler because you could be totally amazing at throwing uh, some sort of technique, a Carolina rig. You could, be a, you could be the best in the world at throwing a Carolina rig, but if the bass are not out deep, if the bass are not biting a Carolina rig, you are not going to catch jack squat. And so you have to understand where those bass are and how they react at certain times of the year. That way, the techniques that you learn in these videos, you can actually apply and have success. You know, if you're watching uh, one of my shallow crankbait videos and you try to go out there and do that in December in Missouri, you're probably not going to have much luck because those bass are not that shallow that time of year. So like I said, super important to understand the life cycle of a bass. But that is enough sitting down for today. We are going to power pull up, pull the trolling motor up, and, uh, and we're going to head around the lake and uh, actually show you guys all the rest of the terms that we're going to discuss. Let's go. All right, so we have reached the first thing that I'm gonna talk about, and that is the differences in certain types of points. Uh, we're gonna talk about a channel swing and basically any like high level terminology when it comes to points and underwater uh, contour lines. And so I, ask, I get asked the question, the difference between a secondary point and a main lake point and really any other points besides that. So right now we have found ourselves a main lake point. 
Main Lake Point is defined as any sort of point on the main lake. As, as, as simple as that definition is, that is so true. Because you are looking for a, a point in the rocks, in the trees, whatever, uh, in your pond, maybe you have a little bit of a, an outcropping, or you have some, some sort of fishing pier that can kind of act as a, as a point for those fish to sit on. That is what's called a main lake point. Uh, and the difference between main lake and secondary is, uh, is really not that hard to understand. You kind of you, you look at your main lake points, and then you go one in or two in from that main lake point in to your creek. So if you're in a pond, you may only have main lake points, you may not have secondary points, but in most lakes, especially lakes like this one today, this Highland Lake, we have tons of secondary points. Now when it comes to large bodies of water, such as uh, Lake Toledo Bend, Sam Rayburn, there are many times when I will call, what somebody would call a secondary point, I will actually call a main lake point. So take for example the creeks of Housen and Six Mile on the Lake Toledo Bend. I'll have all this stuff on the screen right now as a screen record. Uh, those creeks themselves are several miles long and you can't convince me that bass are going to move from Housen to Six Mile throughout their lifetime and if they do it's very very few. Most of those bass that are, that, that are born in a huge creek like that basically live there their entire lives, at least in my experience, and so I'm gonna treat those like a main lake in themselves. So while you may find that the giant point that enters into a huge creek, that's technically a main lake point, but I also treat that huge creek like a main lake in itself. And so I'm gonna treat every main point on that big creek as a main lake point, and then any point on the inside of that farther into their own little creeks, their own little drains, their own little, uh, you know, outcroppings and shootings, I'm gonna call those secondary points. So it really, the, the definition kind of varies depending on what type of lake you're on, but main lake point on the main lake, secondary point just inside. Now the term deep fishing kind of confused me when I was first beginning. Like what is, what is deep? What does it mean to fish deep? Deep to me usually means uh, deeper than you would normally throw a weightless or a very, very slightly weighted soft plastic. So if you're having a fish uh, in 10 feet or more, I would call that sort of deep fishing. Now you can feel free to disagree with me, but I think anywhere from a 10 to 12 foot all the way out to 25, 35 is deep fishing. And then you get to super deep fishing like you have in those very, very clear lakes like the Great Lakes, uh, lakes like, you know, Bullard's Bar in California, where you have to fish in like 100 foot of water, Smith Lake. Oftentimes you gotta fish for spotted bass that are suspended in very deep, deep water. Uh, but deep fishing in general is just more than beating the bank. It is getting off the bank and fishing something, some kind of structure or cover that is down there that is deeper, that those fish are going to move to during certain times of the year like the summer and the winter. So on the screen here I'm gonna have two different things. One is going to be a hump and one is going to be a ledge. Now a hump looks like uh, any sort of rise, usually a circular rise. Imagine it's like a little small mountain uh, in the middle of your lake, that is called a hump. And I guess the, the term hump means that it just rises up. It's, uh, it's just a topographic, you know, a mapping feature that shows that there is a, a rise in the, uh, the, 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 the ground level inside of your lake and bass oftentimes when you're fishing deep will go to those humps and they will sit there because it allows them easy access to kind of come up and feed on any sort of bait fish that are around there but also slide to deeper water if they want and the same thing goes with a ledge now usually ledges are any sort of drop from shallow water to deep water pretty dang quick and it usually goes like from this to this to this so it's not all the time a shallow to ultra deep down to 120 feet. I would call that more of a uh, very, very steep ledge. But most ledges that we're talking about uh, when reference to, let's say the Tennessee Valley Authority Lakes, uh, Kentucky Lake, Gunnersville, Wheeler, Pickwick, all those lakes over there in the summertime that are known for ledge fishing. A ledge is, is, is really, it's a simple term. It is just a drop from shallow water to deep water, usually fairly quickly. And oftentimes that accompanies being near humps uh, depressions, anything like that, that can kind of break up the bottom composition. Bass like to sit on things that are different, and so a ledge is a incredibly opportune spot for bass, especially in the summer, to sit, because they can be up shallow and feed, and then they can slide out to deep water and have some nice, cool, refreshing water during the summertime. So that is the difference between a hump and a ledge, and most of those are oftentimes found on a creek channel. Now, a creek channel is a term that describes uh, the original 
creek that was there before your lake was filled. So most lakes in America are man-made lakes. That means that they have they've taken an area that used to just be a creek or a river. They have dammed it up and allowed it over time to build up and build up. And so of course, you're gonna have still the remnants of that old creek that are there on the bottom. And any sort of topographic map online will show you as this one shows here. Uh, I'll show you exactly where I am on the map. And where the creek channel, what's called swings, is when the creek channel is turning and winding as all creeks do and when it swings up against the bank or it swings up against uh, a hump or, or a ledge area that's where you're going to find a very high percentage area to catch fish so right now i am on an area where the creek channel as you can see swings to the left and then swings back right and i'm on a main lake point right on the creek channel swing I guarantee you if I cast a drop shot or a shaky head out of here, I would catch a fish in a very short amount of time because in the summertime, this is a very high percentage spot. Creek channel swings are not always great for catching bass, but it's a good place to start. If you've never been to a lake, I would suggest looking at your mapping and finding where that creek channel swings into banks, into docks, into different coves, how the creek channel uh, you know, interacts with, with different you know, offshoots of the main lake or some kind of just flat area. But sometimes you're gonna have those those large creeks within your uh, main lake area where the creek had uh, an offshoot before the lake was filled. So make sure you guys are studying your maps, but that is what a creek channel means. The next bass fishing term is a pocket. What the heck is a pocket? A pocket is usually a small area that is within a creek of the main lake. Uh, oftentimes it can be a main lake pocket, but most of the time they're talking about little uh, offshoots within creeks uh, that are often accompanied with secondary or tertiary points. So you're gonna look at your creek, I'll kind of zoom in on this map right here, and I'll point out what a pocket looks like. It, I mean, the, the term really just is defined by what a pocket is in your pants. It is just a little offshoot that kind of contains some things. So it could contain, uh, you know, some lay down trees, some grass, just like you have in your pocket, you got your wallet, you got your keys. Um, that is what a pocket is, super simple term. As we head to the next spot, I wanna talk about two more terms. That is a drain and a ditch. These are all, of course, offshore fishing terms, usually uh, where you're not fishing on the bank specifically. And a drain and a ditch, at least in my experience, have the exact same definition. They are the same thing. You can use the terms interchangeably. Uh, they are anywhere that you, where you have runoff into your main creek. So imagine the creek back in the day. It didn't offshoot into all these little pockets within these creeks. But as you get rain, that is where it drains and it forms a ditch. And so the water drainage over time has formed uh, usually some kind of little uh, depression in the bottom that you, I guess you could call an extension of the main creek channel, but sometimes it doesn't even reach the main creek channel. It is just a underwater depression uh, where those fish oftentimes sit in and ambush prey. And that term I think is also incredibly uh, over explained. You're just looking at any sort of creek, any pocket in there, graph around, find that, that that bottom kind of drops a little bit and drops back up. And oftentimes you're gonna have fish sitting in those. Sometimes like on a lake like Sam Rayburn, it is, it'll be hard to find a, a, a drain per se uh, because there's so much grass and so much cover. But once you do, those fish are going to be stacked in there. So like I said, drain ditch, almost the same thing. All right, so what is a flat you may ask? A flat is very different from a point because actually, as a matter of fact, they're exact opposites. A flat is what you see on the, on the graph right now on, the, on my screen, I'll show you guys what I'm looking at. A flat is where the bottom is flat, where the ground composition under the water is flat. And uh, you're not gonna find bass on a flat in the winter. I guess I shouldn't say you're not going to. Somebody out there is gonna DM me saying they caught him amazing one day on a flat in December. But I'm just saying, for the most part, flats are where fish ambush prey. So bass will push a school of bait fish up onto a flat, a flat area where the fish really don't have anywhere to go. They don't have any, any deep water to escape to. And bass will also use flats to spawn on. Smallmouth bass love to spawn on flats with tons of boulders and stumps around. And so uh, it's pretty simple. A flat is, uh, is just flat. Now something that is not flat, however, is a bluff. So the definition of a bluff is just a, a rocky bank. 
It is any sort of rock uh, that ranges in degree from, I'd say, 35 degree banks, something kind of like this. Uh, that's a 45, so 35 degree bank, maybe to 45, and then all the way to 90. Bluff has a very, very broad definition, but it is just a rock bank. A transition is just like the definition is. It is a change from one thing to the other, and bass, for some odd reason, don't ask me why, Bass love transitions. And so from right here behind me, we have a transition from a uh, little chunk rock to some kind, of, uh, some kind of clay bank. And of course, it also transitions to have some lay down trees. So transitions, great places to catch fish. They are anywhere that you can visually see a transition, whether it's on the bank like this is, very, very obvious, or it could be a transition underwater. It could transition from uh, slate rock to chunk rock, could transition from rocks to weeds. Bass love anywhere that things transition, anywhere that things change. The next few terms I'm gonna knock out real quick right here, they're going to be rock piles, rock spines, and riprap. Those are all three different types of rock features. Now, I could go and do a whole video on different types of rocks out there. There are probably a hundred different types of rocks, but what a rock pile is, is a pile of rocks. Usually underwater that you find with your electronics. Pretty easy to understand. A rock spine is usually where a rock point runs underwater, especially for smallmouth and spotted bass. Uh, a rock spine is very helpful to understand because bass love to sit on those things, uh, especially during the summer and the winter. So rock spines is just a, imagine like you're the spine on your back. It runs out usually from a main lake point and they're very, very distinct, oftentimes very sharp types of rocks. Rip wrap is the term uh, that refers to the type of man-made rock that you find uh, along the shores of marinas and especially along the shore of the dam here at the lake. Uh, I think riprap, I don't know why they chose to name it riprap. I'm sure the reasoning is out there somewhere, but it is called riprap. The rocks are normally the same size. Uh, normally on riprap banks, you don't have any sort of outcroppings that stick out. It's normally just one flat bank, but if fish are on riprap, Man, can they ever be on riprap. It is an awesome bite to throw a, a jerk bait, a square bill crank bait, a buzz bait on. Riprap is a great way to catch some fish. So, so riprap is some very, very simple rock. So let's bring this trolling motor up and talk about different types of wood. Wood is a very important structure when it comes to bass fishing because it's all around the country and bass love to sit in and around wood. Now there's a few different types of wood terminologies that you have to know. And the first of those is standing timber. Now here behind me, we have one or two pieces of standing timber. Couldn't really find a whole lot in this section of the lake, but it is where timber is standing. A lot of these terms, I feel like they're just self-explanatory based on the name, uh, if you just know what each of the, each of the words means. Uh, but standing timber is where you have trees, usually, that did not fall down, were not cut down when a lake was flooded. And so just like this one behind me right here, you have a piece of standing timber. Now bass oftentimes are going to suspend in standing timber or be all the way down on the roots, unlike a laydown. A laydown, as the name implies, is when wood is not straight up and down like vertical standing timber. That wood ain't standing no more, it is laid down. So like we have right behind me right here, we've got a tree that has fallen down, it is laid down in the water, could be any angle, could be at a slight angle, could be totally flat, or could be totally uh, angled down into the water. But any sort of angle of wood is defined as a lay down. I prefer fishing lay downs over fishing standing timber, just because I think the fish have more cover over them like this here. The, the lay down is providing more cover for those fish to sit under and also more structure, more branches as it as the uh, the tree kind of uh, you know falls over, the branches are spreading out horizontally. It provides more cover and structure for those bass as we talked about. So that's a lay down. Now, one more piece of hard structure is a dock. I don't think there's much of a need to describe that one. So let's talk about grass. In my experience, there is not a difference between grass and weeds. I think the difference between grass and weeds is just a definition based on where you live. I know my dad growing up in Minnesota, they always called milfoil, uh, coontail, uh, all that kind of grass you'll have in Minnesota, they called that weeds because weeds almost uh, carries a, a negative uh, definition because of course weeds in your garden are bad. Weeds in your yard are bad. And so most people, especially new bass anglers, call them weeds because you associate that underwater vegetation with getting your lures stuck and being confused as to whether you have a bass or you have a clump of grass down there on your lure. And I think the word you choose to describe aquatic vegetation changes based on where you live 
live in the south we call it grass up north a lot of you guys call it weeds but also a lot of you guys up north have actual types of grass and in florida you have grass as well so you've got kissimmee grass you've got hay grass any kind of thing that actually looks more like a grassy substance but any sort of aquatic vegetation I call grass. I'm not gonna go into it in this video, especially because the lake I'm on today doesn't actually have any grass. I've got tons of videos talking about all the definitions in today's video. I just wanna go over kind of the overview, the crash course, the masterclass of what all these terms are. Grass holds fish, grass pro provides oxygen. Grass cleans the water of, of, of bad stuff in it and it makes water cleaner. And so grass is definitely one of my favorite types of structure to fish. Now grass can turn into cover when the grass has, has grown above the water and is kind of topped out. Then in my opi opinion, it becomes cover, but until then it is structure. So now that I think we've talked about most of those terms, let's talk about specific types of fishing techniques and, and ways to work your lure. The first of those being power fishing. So there's two main types of fishing speeds. There's power fishing and there is finesse fishing. Power fishing has nothing to do with uh, how strong you cast or how strong you set the hook. It is a term that is used to describe the way that you fish, the speed at which you fish. So if you're casting lures such as this top water walking bait, a spook, uh, chatterbait, spinnerbait, crankbait, those are all power fishing techniques. With power fishing, you usually have your trolling motor on a high speed. You are buzzing down the bank about as fast as you can. You are trying to cover water, another term out there that's used often with power fishing, because you want to hit as many spots as possible. And in that, give yourself the best chance at catching fish as possible. Now, the antithesis, the opposite of power fishing is finesse fishing. You know, if I had my way, I would like to power fish and catch fish that way every single time, because I just think that's more fun. I would rather throw moving baits, reaction baits, uh, have a trolling motor on 10 and buzz down the bank and catch fish, but that's not always the case. Sometimes you're gonna have to slow down. And so finesse fishing, the term finesse, I don't exactly know the dictionary definition of that term, but finesse fishing is where you are using a smaller lure, a more uh, subtle presentation in order to trick those bass into eating that may not react to a faster power fishing presentation. So maybe you've got to back off the bank, you've got to throw a lure on a spinning rod, like a drop shot, maybe a finesse jig or a football jig even can kind of be finesse fishing if you fish it slow enough because you are trying to uh, almost, fin I guess the term finesse when it comes to, uh, I don't know, illicit street activities is when like somebody finesses you, like they've they've worked you, they have tricked you, they fooled you, they got money out of you, and that is what we're trying to do with these fish. We are trying to cast our lure out there, and we're not trying to get them to react to something, we're trying to trick them into eating, and that is what the term finesse means. Usually power fishing, covering water is accompanied by reaction baits and a bait caster. Finesse fishing is usually accompanied by a spinning rod and any sort of lures like a shaky head, a drop shot, or a little hair jig. What else do we got? We are cranking through these things. The next one is flipping versus pitching. Is there a difference? Uh, in my opinion, no. The terms are used interchangeably. Yes, I know that flipping was, was done like this back in the day where of course your bail is closed and in order to get the most presentations possible, you kind of pull on your line. I guess it would be like this. You pull on your line, you allow it to flip out there, you work it, you pull it back again, you flip it out there. I guess that's technically flipping and I guess pitching is technically opening your bail and flicking the lure out there. I don't really care. Flipping, pitching, they're all the same thing to me. Use them interchangeably. The next four are cranking, jerking, popping, and twitching. So with cranking, that is usually uh, a term used to describe using a crankbait. So you are taking your reel handle and you are cranking it. You are constantly moving that bait back to the boat. Of course, if I say you're gonna crank it faster and you're gonna crank it slower, that is the speed at which you are cranking your lure. Now the last three, jerking, popping, and twitching, I believe they were, almost have the exact same um, definition, and that is to cast your lure out there, whether you're throwing a jerk bait, whether you're throwing a spinner bait, you wanna give it some extra action, you're throwing a swim bait, a popper, you're going to want to give that lure some action, and that is oftentimes done with a movement of the rod tip. So to jerk your lure is to go like this. You are jerking it. You are literally taking the rod and you're almost jerking it away from those fish in order to provoke a strike. Popping is usually with your rod tip down, you're kind of giving it a little pop, pop, 
pop, and that is oftentimes used uh, with a topwater popper, a topwater frog. You are allowing that bait to make a popping uh, sound, a popping motion. I guess you could also call it twitching your lure. Uh, twitching is usually the very, very smallest movement. So if I'm say that you're fishing a, a topwater frog and I say I'm gonna twitch it, I'm gonna give it just the tiniest little movements on my rod tip. And one last term uh, when it comes to using your rod and reel and your, your retrieve effectively is called reeling in your slack. Now, uh, my dad always told me growing up, you know, no slacking. When you're working on a job, there's no slacking, and that means there's no room for error. There is no extra stuff laying around. There's no um, en energy not being used, and the same thing can go when you are fishing. A slack line is when your line is not tight. You are not ready to catch that fish, and so oftentimes I'll say you want to reel in the slack. You want to make sure you have no slack before you set the hook, and when you're working your lures, you almost always want to have a tight, uh, a tight line. And so if you make a cast out there, and as you can see right here, I've got so much slack line just laying here, and I want to work this jig. I'm not going to work it like this, because I have too much slack out. There's too much uh, weakness out there, per se. And so I want to reel in, I want to have my line completely tight to get rid of all of the slack. Let's get it to it! The next terms I want to discuss are graphs and electronics. Graphs and electronics both refer to your fish finder. Those are just different in interchangeable terms uh, to talk about your hummingbird, your Garmin, your Lowrance, and there's several terms that come along with that. So when you are using your electronics to find fish, you're going to be doing what's called graphing, where you are you are almost, I guess back in the day, uh, when I think the old, the old Lowrance fish finders, they would actually have a paper that would go across the screen that a, a, a pencil or some kind of pen would draw and would make a graph as to what the bottom looked like. Nowadays, I wouldn't necessarily describe it as a graph because you're seeing like, especially with live scope, you're seeing fish live. It's not necessarily a graph that you learn about in math class, but the term is still there from back in the day that you are, when you're looking for fish using your electronics, you are graphing fish. And what you, what, you, what you say when you find a fish is that you are marking them. You are marking a fish on the graph. You are seeing a return in the water column uh, the, the water column means uh, the depth of water from the bottom to the top. You are marking a fish, you are seeing one on your electronics, you are graphing it. I know it's all kind of circular logic, but you are using your electronics to graph and mark the fish. Let's talk about some of the funny ones that make bass fishing so fun to talk about with your buddies and also so confusing and sometimes weird to those people that don't bass fish. So we all love calling big bass something different. You know, there's so many different names out there and I'm probably not gonna name them all, but I'm gonna name all the ones that come into my head. You've got slaunch, pig, toad, donkey, gorilla, um, trench, panda, dog, mega. Lunker, I don't think I've mentioned, but that's what makes it so much fun is that there's so many out there. When it comes to small fish, a dink, D-I-N-K, dink is a term that people use to describe. Usually a fish under a pound is what's called a dink. So if you go to somebody and ask them how their day was, they said, ah, I caught a bunch of dinks. That means they caught a bunch of small fish. Uh, when an angler is really, really good, we oftentimes refer to that angler as a stick or a hammer. Don't know why, hammer and stick are usually the two words we use to describe a good angler. When you're describing the best possible fishing area, and oftentimes it is the, the smallest little section within a brush pile, within a grass line, that is called the juice. The, the best place to catch fish on your area is called the juice. Um, when you're fishing a, a soft plastic, let's say on the back of a jig, or you're just flipping a soft plastic, you get a bite, you swing and set the hook, and you reel back in nothing, that is oftentimes referred to as the bass pulling your pants down. I know it's weird. It's one of my favorite ones out there, especially when you're fishing a jig and you set the hook and they miss it, but you come back and your, your trailer is either halfway bitten off or it is pulled down onto the bottom of your hook. Uh, just like uh, you know somebody bullying a kid in middle school, they pull their pants down, a bass is doing the exact same thing. He's pulling your pants down. And the last one that I can think of on the top of my head before I put the boat on the trailer to end today's video is going to be a cricket. Now a cricket is not a thunder cricket as the striking thunder cricket implies. A cricket is a, is a term that was coned, I believe, by Greg Hackney. Now maybe he wasn't the guy that first talked about a cricket, but it is just uh, 
uh, a, a term to describe your lure, usually a jig or a, a chatterbait. Uh, really anything can be described as a cricket. So that is it everybody, I hope that you enjoyed. It's probably a longer video than I anticipated, but this was like I said, a master class when it comes to fishing terminology. This is an awesome sport and I love it, but it can definitely be a bit daunting sometimes to somebody who has never done it before and hears all these wild terms and is nothing but confused. So if you guys enjoyed, hit the subscribe button. We're gonna hit you guys with a lot of cool fishing content coming up soon and we'll see y'all next time on TRF.